Okie dokie. Grab my pocket Bible. All right. As you can see from the screen, that's probably a very familiar picture on the right hand side. And there's, I'm sure there's one um, guy we don't want to be like, and then the other guy we do I, want to. So that's going to be. Don't mean to. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but I don't have the luxury of seeing the screen tonight. Oh, of course. Let me explain it to you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, there's the sorry. two. There's the two worshipers on the screen. We have, as you know, the Pharisee just like bragging away. And then we have the publican in the background who is just so distraught. He's so downridden. Um, he doesn't even feel like he's worthy oh. to pray to God. And I'm That's sure that right. with a lot of us that might strike a nerve because maybe we've been like a Pharisee or maybe we've been like a publican. But tonight we're actually going to look at that parable and we're going to look at two other parables that aren't talked about as much. And all these parables have to do with prayer. So Deirdre, at any time, feel free to interject if there's anything that like we don't explain or we don't describe. Just let us know because you're part of the group and we want to make sure it's easy to understand. I appreciate that very much. I appreciate it. Dan's not able to be with us tonight, unfortunately. He's kind of busy, but um, his thoughts and prayers are with okay. the group tonight. So, Well, thank you. We're happy you're here. Well, I'll just start with prayer if you don't mind. Dear Lord, ironically, tonight we are studying more about prayer, and there is so much that I need to learn. So I ask that you pour your spirit upon us out on this group, Lord, as we read through scripture, um, as we pray, as we study, as we read through spirit of prophecy. Please help something to stick out, something new that will deepen and revitalize our walk with you. In your Amen. holy, precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to briefly go over the parable of the friend at midnight. The second parable will be the unjust judge. And the third parable will be the two worshipers. And on the screen, there's a chart here of all the parables. And whoever made this chart organized them very nicely. And you can see that all the parables are actually contained in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So it'll just be a minute here while I um, try to get it quiet in the background. I'm just going to mute this for a minute. Sorry, I had a lot of background noise. So as you can see, the parables we're going to study tonight are contained in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, known as the Synoptic Gospels. John doesn't contain any parables. And from the second chart, you can see they're grouped by category. There's kingdom parables, there's sinner parables, forgiveness parables. And tonight, there's three specific parables on prayer. And they're all taken from the book of Luke, Luke chapter 11 and Luke chapter 18. And I certainly learned a lot of, from these parables. I think in particular, the parable of the two worshipers was something I thought I knew because since a young child, that's something that's taught a lot in Sabbath school, but there really was so much I didn't know. So tonight's study was a blessing to me and I pray it's a blessing to you as well. So if you'd like to grab your Bibles, Luke chapter 11, verses one to 13. So if someone would be willing to read, you can read all of it. You could read part of it. But the first part is going to give us the context as to this first parable. And it's going to give a little background information. So Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 13. I can read a little bit. The Lord's Prayer. Now Jesus was praying. Luke 11, right? That's, yeah, that's still, it. Got it. Okay, just making sure. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone <laughs> who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you two has a, a friend? will go, has a friend, will go to him at midnight and say, say to him, friend, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within. Do not bother me. The door is shut, now shut. And my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is 
the friend, yet because of his imp impudence, impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, and I tell you, ask, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks <clears throat> receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open. But uh, let me see. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will indeed instead give him a, uh, a, a fish for the serpent? A fish, instead give him a fish, will give him a serpent. Or if he, he asks for a, an egg, will give him a scorpion. If you then who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Well, it almost worked. There you Thank go. Thank you. <laughs> so there's a lot of teachings. We could probably spend an hour just on that passage alone. Uh, but That's before true. we get into the historical context of the parable, what stands out to you about this parable or this passage? Um, what were some of the things we should be asking for? What are some of the things we should be doing? You know, we should be constantly asking the Lord for his advice and his direction. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then if we don't ask confidently enough, I guess, and I don't know if that's the word confidently enough, faith in faith enough, mm -hmm. or if we don't keep asking it's not going to happen. It shows you don't really care. You forgot about it. Yeah, I wanted that car yesterday, but today I don't need it. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Talk to me, people. <laughs> no, you bring up a good point because, oh, what were you going to say? I was going to say, sometimes I forget things like I'll forget what I confessed the day before, or I'll forget some sin that I confessed a month ago. And I find myself going over and over things. I, I tell myself it's, it must be that I didn't care. It must be that I didn't really confess with a fully repentant heart. Or I'll, I'll forget something I asked for a week ago. And I'll think, well, you know, I kind of chide myself for being careless when it might be something else. You know, I don't know. It could be either way, I guess. That's, I kind of feel the same way that it, sometimes it's so important at that time, but I guess I'm going by feelings and not by principle. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I should just tell yeah. myself that. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I, I, just, I need this thing. I, I need this thing. It, it's actually, I just want this thing, whatever it is. Um, and then I realize that I, I need to be led by the Holy spirit and not by my feelings. So that's why I'm asking. Uh, Guide me, O oh Lord. Teach me thy ways. I'm very selfish. I'm only thinking of myself. I'm thinking of the next parables. <laughs> well, that's you brought up the Holy Spirit because I never realized that the parable of the friend at midnight is about asking for the Holy Spirit. Because we can see from the context of the passage, and I'm not going to read these bottom paragraphs to you, but I'll send it out to you if you want to read it more. The disciples were really self-conscious. They felt like they didn't know how to pray. So they asked Jesus how to pray. And right away, he gives them the Lord's Prayer. Then he tells them this parable. And after this parable, he then gives some Proverbs. And he says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and ye shall find. And a lot of people misquote that, including myself. Because if someone asks for something, we might say, ask and ye shall receive. But if we read the rest of the passage... And we go all the way to the end, verse 13. It says, how much more so will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask? So just like this friend was begging his friend, please, please, please give me that bread so that I can feed my friends. We should be begging God and saying, please, please, please give us the Holy Spirit because we can't feed other people until you give it to us. And I had no Amen. idea that that's what this parable was all about. And Ellen White oh. is going to unpack it a little bit more. But to me, that just reminded me, I need to specifically ask for the Holy Spirit. Because how on earth can I witness to others if I'm not even asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit? So if someone would be willing to read um, these passages on the screen, this is taken from Christ Object Lessons. And then we'll talk about the question at the bottom. 
In like manner, the disciples were to seek blessings from God in the feeding of the multitude and in the sermon on the bread from heaven, Christ had opened to them their work as his representatives. They were to give the bread of life to the people. He who had anointed their work saw how often their faith would be tried. Often they would be thrown into unexpected positions and would realize their human insufficiency. Souls Amen. that were hungering for the bread of life would come to them and they would feel themselves to be destitute and helpless. Christ directs them to the source of supply. The man whose friend came to him for entertainment, even at the unseasonable hour of midnight, did not turn him away. He had nothing to set before him, but he went to one who had food and pressed his request until the neighbor supplied his needs. And would not God, who had sent his servants to feed the hungry, supply their need for his own work? Amen. What a blessing. She unpacks this a whole lot more if you read the chapter on the friend at midnight. But what are some things that stand out to you about either her comments or the parable itself? Well, what stood out for me about the parable is when you, well... I was thinking that midnight, the word midnight was kind of a giveaway because I thought about the 10 virgins and, and the oil. Hmm. And I figured it must be about the Holy Spirit or the arrival of the bridegroom at the very least. Mm -hmm. hmm. You know, usually when certain words are mentioned, it's kind of a dead giveaway that there's something else going on than meets the eye. Mm -hmm. That makes me sense. No, that makes perfect sense. I never thought about the connection between the Holy Spirit and midnight, but you're right. Whenever it says midnight, we should listen up. It means it's last day events. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, yeah, I, I never realized that either, that he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And that you need to cons continually seek mm -hmm. uh, and ask and knock, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, good. Thank you very much. I'm glad you guys re revealed this to me. <laughs> uh, Charles Spurgeon, as you know, that probably rings a bell, very, very famous evangelical pastor. And this is what he has to say about intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is exceedingly prevalent. What wonders it has wrought. The word of God teems with its marvelous deeds. Believer, thou hast a mighty engine in thy hand. Use it well. Use it constantly. Use it with faith. And thou shalt surely be a benefactor to thy brethren. So praying to the Holy Spirit, praying to God, we have a mighty engine in our hand. It can turn the world upside down. So let's use it well. Let's use it constantly. And let's use it with faith. And just like Amen. the friend at midnight, he wasn't asking for bread for himself. He was actually asking friend asking for bread to provide it for someone else. And that's really what intercessory prayer is. Intercessory prayer, we're not really praying for ourselves. We're actually praying for other people. And we know that it's something that we can't do for ourselves. And I know a lot of times that when I pray, I tend to focus on things that are near and dear to me, whether it's something in my own life or my friend's life or something that's ongoing at my work. And sometimes I forget to expand my prayer to pray about other things that are even more important. So I'm not going to go through this tonight, but I will just send you the PDF. But if you're looking to expand your prayer life, just think of the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S. We don't want to forget to adore God. We don't want to forget to confess our sins. And we specifically want to thank God. But also we want to ask him to supply other people's needs. And if you're not sure exactly how to expand your prayer life, just look at your hand. And this helps me. I try to do this every day because if I only pray about what comes to mind, I'm going to pray for Mark. I'm going to pray for Jeff or for my parents. Like I need to pray for more than that. So if you look at your hand, this will detail it more when I send it out to you, but your thumb is closest to you. So you pray for yourself and for people close to you. Your pointer finger is people that point you to God. So like church leaders or teachers or spouses, people that point you to God. 
Your middle finger is the tallest. So we should pray for people that govern us, our employers, government, things like that. Oh, yes, Mark. No, I was practicing. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> so your middle, <laughs> your middle finger is not what is commonly used for. In this case, it's actually used to pray for people that govern us. And then your weak finger, your ring finger is for the weak people, the widows, maybe the singles, maybe the sick people, the older people. Not that they're necessarily weaker than us, but maybe people that don't have a support system like we do. And then lastly, hmm. your pinky finger is actually for, um, I should actually say pinky finger is yourself. Your thumb is actually for your family and those close to you. And your pinky finger is for oh. last. And I know for me, when I start using my fingers to pray, honestly, by the time I get to the pinky finger, my issues are not really that important after I've interceded for other people. So maybe this Amen. week, make sure to pray for the Holy Spirit, but maybe use some of these charts to kind of expand your prayer life. When I wake up in the middle of the night and I can't go back to sleep, I just run through the five finger prayer. And guess what? Nine out of 10 times, I fall asleep before I get to the pinky finger. So it's a great way to put yourself to sleep, but it's also a great way to remember to pray for other people. <laughs> so Good. a lot of times people wonder, like, why is God represented as a selfish neighbor? Because God is not selfish. And in this case, the neighbor's like, get away from me. It's late. Stop asking me. And then the guy keeps knocking again and again and again. And then the neighbor finally gives him some bread. So... I just wanted to go over this briefly because sometimes this could be confusing to people. So what do you think? Do you think the selfish neighbor represents God? Why or why not? Hmm. The selfish neighbor. By contrast, it's always by contrast, of course, because God is more than willing to give us all that we ask and believe and, and want, if it's according to his will, of course. But uh, yeah, so. yeah, you brought up a great point, Mark, because Ellen White mentioned that as well. The lesson is drawn not by comparison, but by contrast. So if that selfish neighbor who was getting so angry finally gave in and gave his friend some bread, God, who was not selfish and not angry, is going to give it to us right away. So we really yeah. don't need to be scared to go to God, because if the selfish neighbor finally caved in, our Father in Heaven is going to give us every single thing that's good for us. So yeah. can anybody think of something that you asked God for in the past that he actually gave you? Because he's a good father. He's a kind father. Because um, it's important we remind ourselves of this. Um, does anyone feel comfortable sharing a time where you asked the Lord for something and he gave it to you? I can tell you this. Mm -hmm. um, unless somebody else has got something to say. <laughs> I've always got something to say. Mm -hmm. Anyway, my son, James, uh, you know, he's a pastor and he, he taught me about freedom. And uh, we were driving along the road one day and I was complaining. I was saying, you know, I need, I don't have enough money to do this or that. And, and uh, he says, uh, Papa, calls me Papa. He says, Papa, I, can I say something here? He says, what you're saying is a lie. Like, oh, it is? Well, God owns the whole world. He's got cattle and hair. He's got everything. So just ask him for it. No, so I just didn't. Everything turned out okay in the next week or two. But I'm just saying that sometimes, even 50 years old in this business of being a Christian, I get mixed up and I lean to my own understanding instead of his. <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> I know for me, I've been looking for a way to use my free time wisely because I, I don't like being volunteered for stuff that I don't feel is important. So I'm not looking to like fill up my free time with like meaningless things, but I feel like I should be doing more for God. And um, I was praying about it. And for a while I was praying, but it was like haphazardly. It wasn't really consistently and nothing was coming across my path. And then finally, I was like, maybe this is something I need to fast about and actually take to God seriously in prayer. I didn't wow. even get to the fasting part. I actually just started <laughs> praying about it consistently. And then I was like, maybe I should start looking around. And I started Googling opportunities. And the first thing that popped up was actually teaching English to local immigrants and teaching citizenship classes. And I contacted them. They're five minutes away down the street. 
They got me in immediately. They said, hey, you're already a teacher. We're not even really going to interview you. Let's just show you what we have. See if it's a fit. It's been an amazing fit. Like I've been able to actually have some spiritual conversations with people. Brenda helped me. I made some goodie bags for 4th of July. I'm going to have some spiritual literature in there, um, some contact information to the churches. And my goal in doing that is to actually do something good for the community, but hopefully to eventually bring them to the Benita Spanish church because most of them are Spanish. And I would love to do that. And God provided that opportunity literally within a day. So I Amazing. feel like sometimes God makes you wait a while, but sometimes he answers it right away. And to me, this was just like a wonderful blessing. Um, the students are a blessing to me, but I also feel like I'm occupying my time well. So I'm not just like wasting my time at home. So for Amazing. me, that was a way God answered my prayer. Does anyone Amazing. else have a time maybe when God answered your prayer right away? When I first became a Christian, since nobody said anything, <laughs> within the first week or two, I, I had a I had a Datsun pickup truck. Did I already tell you this? Anyway, anyway, I'm gonna tell it to you again. I had a Datsun pickup truck and and it stalled on me. And I had my girlfriend in the car. Guess what I did? Oh, Mark, I accidentally muted you. I meant to mute my. Can you hear me now? Yes, Mark, sorry. I meant to mute myself, not you. I'm sorry. I'm muting myself. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, so a simple thing. I uh, I prayed, bowed my head out there in this neighborhood where my, my car was stuck. I had this this pickup truck that I didn't know anything about because it was new for me and it, it had dual points in it. I didn't know that until I, I opened the hood and I saw the cap was off a little bit. Uh, I have to know what a distributor cap was and it was off and it had dual points. One set of the points was loose. So I, I guessed that the, you know, you, you got to make it a certain amount of space in there, 16,000, 18,000. So I guessed on a penny. I had a penny. I stuck a penny in there to measure it. So things started right up and off I went. I wasn't there very long at all. Usually back then when I had to fix a car, it took me a long time. So praise the Lord that he answered that. There's plenty of those prayer things, fixing cars and fixing stuff. The Lord knows how to fix stuff. Praise the Lord. I get stuck in my business sometime. I don't know what to do on a particular knee. It's a micro process. <clears throat> So I'll just stop and I'll just say, I'm going to pray if you don't mind. <laughs> so I'll pray. And the Lord resolves the problem. I never would have figured it out without him. So yeah, I, I'm not afraid to ask for him. Right in front of my patients, I do it. My son thinks, that, you know, why do you do that? Then you tell him that, that you're praying. I say, yeah, because I don't know what I'm doing right now. <laughs> but he dies. So praise the Lord. Amen. And my husband, Jeff, has something as well, because it's always good we remind ourselves of how God will grant us things that are good for us. So, Jeff, if you'd like to share, that would be great. Sure. Um, so I was just kind of thinking of like a recent, a serious and kind of an amazing, although they're always amazing, answered prayers. So a uh, recent one is just traveling safeties. You know, we pray every time we get in the car and 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 we're still here. And and sometimes I think we forget to give God the praise after answering all those mm -hmm those prayers, you know, uh, like traveling yeah. safeties and things like that. So definitely um, I, I, I like to think about that. Um, the serious um, one would be, you know, my wife and, and, and her surgery, you know, God answered our prayers and, and look, she looks Amen. amazing and, and, and is doing well. So that was I'm huge. still handicapped, but huge. less handicapped than I was. <laughs> huge so. answer to prayer. And then um, the amazing one was I had a coworker who, um, when I, um, was coming to the Lord, I was on fire and I'm still on fire, but I, I was, I had him on a boat with me and he, yes. he, he was trapped, uh, uh, trapped audience, you know, so he couldn't go anywhere. It was besides overboard. And I was kind of, <laughs> and I was hitting him over the head with the Bible yeah. <laughs> and, he, and he told me, he said, okay, stop enough already. He goes, my <laughs> church, my church is this. And he showed me a picture of like a, of a, a target from a gun range that he went and go shoot. And he was a heavy drinker and cursor and, and all that. And, um, 
and I prayed for him. I really prayed for him. And amazingly, uh, he's turned his life around. He's given up drinking. He actually left um, doing police where he retired early. Him and his wife live a very happy life, and he attends a church regularly. And he is uh, he is a firm believer in in God, and uh, and it's just wonderful to see that God can take someone like that and turn them around. Um, not saying it's my will, but it's God's will, and and uh, but those were answered uh, prayers of mine as well. So, Amen. 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 Uh, so don't forget to ask, because just like a good father, if it is good for you, God will delight in giving it to you. And especially ask for the Holy Spirit, because that Amen. friend couldn't feed his other friend until the master gave him that bread. And we need the bread. We need the oil. We need the Holy Spirit from God before we can share it with other people. So number one, Amen. don't Amen. forget to ask. And number two, maybe ask specifically for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh. Amen. The second parable is something that I'm sure we're very familiar with, the two worshipers. I wish I could say I was always like the publican, but we know that's not the case because pride is something we all struggle with. Um, Self-sufficiency is something we struggle with. Selfishness, narcissism, wanting our way. And I know sometimes it's not popular to talk about that because people like to think that they're good. They like to think that they're really not that bad, especially compared to others. But that was the problem with the Pharisee. So I know as we read this, there's going to be a lot of things that personally strike at me, but I need to know this. So let's go to Luke chapter 18. Uh, just a few chapters later, Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. So if somebody would be willing to read that parable, that would be wonderful. I could do that. Thank you. Whoops. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Marilyn. This this is from the clear word. Jesus told his disciples another story, <clears throat> excuse me, aimed at those religious leaders who prided themselves in doing everything just right and despised others who didn't. Jesus said two men went to the synagogue to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up near the front and prayed to himself saying, Dear Lord, I want to thank you that I'm not like the others. These money grabbers, liars, adulterers, or even this tax collector in the back of the synagogue who has sold out to the Romans. I fast twice each week and pay an honest tithe on all my income. And now the tax collector stood in the back of the synagogue, not feeling worthy to even come to the front or to look up to God. But he bowed his head quietly and he beat on his chest and he prayed, Oh, God, forgive me. I am. I'm a sinner who desperately needs your help. Jesus added, I want to tell you that the tax collector went home forgiven, not the Pharisee. Those who think they're righteous and are filled with pride don't feel their need of help, but those who realize their need are humble and God will honor them. Amen. 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 And this was specifically directed, Ellen White and scripture both mention it, and it says, unto search of which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others, Christ spoke the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. And I'm sure at some point we could all relate to this. Maybe at some point we've trusted in our own righteousness. I know that isn't really an issue for me because I have so much sin. There's no way I trust in my own righteousness. But there's been lots of times maybe when I've despised others or been critical or judgmental. So in particular, this parable speaks to me because Jesus specifically gave it to people that either thought they were righteous or people that despised others. So now we're going to look at briefly, what was the Pharisee like? So um, there are three paragraphs here. Maybe we can get one, two, or three people to read them, and then we'll talk about what the Pharisee was like. I'll read the first one. Thank you. The Thank Pharisee you. goes up to the temple to worship not because he feels that he's a sinner in need of pardon, but because he thinks of himself righteous and hopes to win commendation. His worship he regards as an act of merit that will recommend him to God. At the same time, it will give the people a high opinion of his piety. He hopes to secure favor with both God and man 
His worship is prompted by self-interest. And he is, and he is full of self-praise. He looks it, he walks it, he prays it, drawing apart from others as if to say, Come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. Isaiah 65, verse 1, verse 5. He stands and prays for himself, wholly satisfied, wholly self-satisfied. He thinks that God and men regard him with the same complacency. God, I thank thee, he says, that I am not as other men are, extortionist, unjust, adulterous, or even as the publican. He judges his character not by the holy character of God, but by the char character of other men. His mind is turned away from God to humanity. This is the secret of his self-satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot in there. Um, what are some things that stand out about the Pharisee? Well, he, he likes to compare himself with other people. And, you know, you can't do that. That's not wise. So, but I find myself, <laughs> as we're reading this on the way to work, I was just about to turn the corner to get to work. And I was thinking, you know, I'm kind of glad that I'm not like my... <laughs> And then it came to me who I was talking about. <laughs> oh, anyway. So, yeah. Praise the Lord. You're, you're reading this. It's another rebuke, but it's also a blessing to me that I'm not any better than anybody else. <laughs> That's the responsibility that would involve. Be better than someone else. <laughs> I think that the major problems here is that we all tend to judge the other people. And because we want to judge people, we uh, uh, tend to find fault. And we, we're we not in the business of being able to judge anything. And, Amen. and so I think that if we could uh, only get ourselves to the point to, to understand that uh, we're really, really... Uh, you know, in a position of only asking for forgiveness and not in the business. You know, I, I always think of, um, you know, we have certain people that will be up in front and all, and always be uh, uh, very pious and so on and so forth. And that's fine. You know, it, it may be in a, a sincere situation. And I'm not to be able to be judge it, judging that at all. Excellent points, John. I, I really appreciate you sharing that. That's probably one of the biggest things that's turned people away from the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I feel it all the time. Mm -hmm. Amen. And the Pharisees, they would specifically pat themselves on the back or draw attention to themselves. They lived in a Jewish society, so of course people were always praying, and sometimes they would stop and pray at street corners or in the middle of the street, and they wouldn't just pray for two minutes. They'd have like 15, 20, one-hour prayers, and people would just look at them like how holy those people are. And sometimes they'd, they'd tie bells to the bottom of their ropes so that wherever they went, you could kind of hear them rustle, and people would just be kind of in awe of them. That was actually supposed to be done to the high priest so that when he ministered in the sanctuary, you could hear those bells. And if you stopped hearing those bells, you know, maybe he got struck dead by God. That was the intention of them to be like a beautiful sound to like reassure you that the high priest was ministering on your behalf. But the Pharisees perverted it and they specifically put it on their own gowns so that wherever they went, people would notice that they were there. They demand the best seats. They would bring all this attention to themselves. And when people would maybe compliment them or flatter them, you could just see them get puffed up with pride because this is what they craved. When do we get to the fine line, though, of. Uh, and the, the fine line that I find is that. Uh, um you know, I don't want to do things in public like uh, that would call attention. Mm -hmm. And yet, I don't want to ever be accused of being ashamed of my Lord. Right. Amen. And I think because you genuinely walk with Christ, John, like to us, it's very evident, like 
when you do kind things for other people, it's because like you feel called to do that because you want to do it. Like you're not doing it and then like publicizing it to everyone else. And I think sometimes we do have to talk about the things we do because they come up in conversation. But I think um, if we're like specifically bringing them up just so that people will notice us or talk to us about it, then our motive's wrong. But sometimes it naturally comes up in conversation like, oh, I'm doing this at the church or I'm doing this for the community. And the Lord knows our motives. But I know, especially on this group, I believe a lot of you guys naturally do these things. You're not doing it for public applause. And if you got no credit for it, I know 100% you would do it anyways because it's the right thing. So whatever that fine line is, I feel like you have found that fine line. But I agree with you. We always need to be like making sure that we're walking that fine line. What were you going to say? Um, I don't know. I just think that like, isn't it amazing how God puts these stories in the Bible and 2000 years later, we have to look at ourselves in the mirror and agree that it's still applicable. And yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. right. <laughs> and, then, and then, John, to your point, I mean, I don't know, but initially when you said, I, could you repeat what you said about denying my Lord? Is that what you said? I, I don't want to... Yeah. yeah, you know the, what I'm what I'm talking about is that, uh, he who denies me, right. I will. Deny. And and, and I know, think, right? And and I think that's why he gave us the story of Peter, right? And 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 the crows, you know, or the, cro uh, yeah. the rooster. rooster. Sorry, yeah. thank you. <laughs> you know, and and he gives us these stories so that we know, and we have, and we know, kind of, the difference, and know that we we're still going to struggle with it thousands of years later. That's right. That's right. I, and and don't, you know, I, I think any of us that think that the other person is very secure, uh, I look into myself and I know I'm not that secure and I'm, I'm sure they're not that secure either. Uh, you know, we have a walk with our Lord, yes. But the fact is that we're, I question mine all the time. Yeah. Can I just address that a little bit here? You know, and that's that's how I, I have been for 50 years. Well, 49 years. Last year, I changed my mind. I'm no longer going to be this, this person that is constantly condemning myself because I'm a sinner uh, and beating myself up because I didn't do enough or I didn't share enough. I didn't offer enough. I didn't help enough. I was I was beating myself up all the time. And my, my, uh, my receptionist, Karen, she says, stop it. Just stop it. That's that's not healthy, what you're thinking. Uh, I said, well, you know, the closer you come to the Lord, the more sinful you see yourself. She says, well, just you've got to stop that. You're you're a kind man. You're a generous man. And you need you need to thank the Lord for, for these blessings. Well, after that, I just want you to know that there's a thing called freedom in Christ. And, you know, I, I pray it all the time because God sees us as righteous, holy, just and good. Not as sinners. He died for us. So sin is done. It's eradicated. Where there's no more death, no more lies that we can we can have that we if we unless we accept them, of course. But we don't have to believe the liar anymore because Christ died for us and he separated us, separated that sin from us. And that's the whole purpose of this this message in the last days. God yes. is enough. Amen. Amen. Because the devil loves it when we look at ourselves, because in many people's instance, it's easy to elevate yourself. But there's also like, I'm sure many of you are like this too, like those of us with like a super sensitive personality and conscience, it's easy to condemn ourselves for every single thought and word we've ever, I mean, I feel guilty about stuff I did when I was like six years old, I'm almost 40. And like, I feel like my dad explained it to me one time. He's like, the devil loves it when you focus on yourself, like you need to lift your eyes to Jesus. Because if you're focusing just on yourself, you're as bad as the Pharisee. You might not be mm. elevating yourself, but you're becoming obsessed with yourself because you're thinking about every possible thing you ever did and how you did it wrong and how you're beating yourself up. So repentance is important. I'm not saying like we can't go to heaven without repenting. I'm not saying that like repentance is not important, but I am saying that sometimes some of us can be like the Pharisee and that we focus so much on ourselves and we analyze every single thing we ever did and we just get depressed we get downtrodden we compare ourselves to other people and then it seems like it's almost hopeless and that's what the devil loves us to do there's a fine line because repentance is necessary 
And the Repub the I said Republican, I'm sorry, Republican. <laughs> I do not mean Republican here. <laughs> so Republican <laughs> in general. The Republican knew that whatever he did was heinous in the sight of God. And Ellen White has a beautiful way of just describing his repentance. This is what she says. The publican had gone to the temple with other worshipers, but he soon drew apart from them as unworthy to unite in their devotions. Standing afar off, he would not lift so much his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast in bitter anguish and self-abhorrence. He felt that he had transgressed against God, that he was sinful and polluted. He could not accept even pity from those around him, for they looked upon him with contempt. He knew that he had no merit to commend him to God. In an utter self-despair, he cried, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He did not compare himself with others. Overwhelmed with a sense of guilt, he stood as if alone in God's presence. His only desire was for pardon and peace. His only plea was the mercy of God, and he was blessed. I tell you, Christ said, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Amen. For the rest of his life, if he would have just focused on himself, he would have been just as bad as the Pharisee. But he focused on himself. He repented. But as soon as he received that blessing of forgiveness, he went up leaving a justified man. So he accepted the forgiveness that Christ gave him. Amen. Yes. So we all want to be like the publican, I'm sure. So if someone could read uh, these small bullet points here, and then we'll talk about how can we today be like the publican. But we must have a knowledge of ourselves, a knowledge that will result in contrition before we can find pardon and peace. It is only he who knows himself to be a sinner that Christ can save. We must know our real condition or we shall not feel our need of Christ's help. We must understand our danger, or we, sh we shall not flee to the refuge. We must feel the pain of our wounds, or we should not desire healing. Amen. Amen. So what were some characteristics of the publican, or what are some ways that we can be like the publican? Well, always it's it's comparing ourselves. You know, that's 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 probably the the greatest fault that I've ever had in my life. But when I come across it, and it seems like I I've been doing it more recently, uh, you're not that great either, Mark. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you screw up too. So quit judging that person. Okay, because I'm usually thinking about one of my kids or something. <laughs> you know. Anyway, I'm just saying that it's easy for me. To be this guy, you know, not the publican, but the Pharisee. I'm kind of great because look at all the good things I did. And then uh, the Lord comes into my life and shows me, you're not that great. I'm great. So you better get to know me because you need to be like me and not like anybody else. That's the one. <laughs> it's not It's not getting to heaven, which is so important. It's to become like Christ, to go back into his image. Oh. The most important thing expand go ahead i think no pain um that our that we bring to the lord with our sins is something that um draws us to desire that healing that we might not do that again we do not want to bring that pain to to jesus i do not want my fingerprints on that cross of of amen Amen. if you read this chapter the two worshipers in christ's object lessons she talks a lot about peter because peter was a pharisee at first he was a deeply religious man he had walked with john the baptist he followed christ for three years and he was adamant that he would never deny christ he was standing in his own righteousness and he thought hey i'm good enough i will stand for christ i will fight for christ we know that's not the case. And what gets me every time is like that third time when he cursed Christ, the Bible says Christ turned and looked at him. They locked eyes and he just left there bitter, anguished, ashamed, and he was beating himself up all weekend long. And that's why I find it so amazing that when Jesus resurrected, one of the first people he wanted to console was Peter. 
And then Jesus went looking for him and Jesus found him on the seashore. You know, he cooked him some fish and then he famously asked him three times, do you love me? And that was just to reassure Peter, like, I forgive you. You denied me three times. I forgive you three times. And after that, Peter truly was a broken man. And Ellen White talks about this and she says he needed to be broken because he was self-sufficient. He trusted in his own righteousness and he was really harsh with other people. And as the leader of the early Christian church, he needed to be gentle. And she said this was the perfect situation to break him because now he was more equipped to lead the church of God. So if you want to find out more about that, read this chapter in Christ's Object Lessons. But a perfect example is Peter, who was once a Pharisee, who then became a publican. I think the, uh, you know, recently Marilyn and I have been watching um, some of the um, uh, stories about uh, different, you know, people back in those days. But the one that has impressed me as much as any is Mary Magdalene. Mm. Uh, mm. She came from the depths and uh, found her way to uh, the Lord through uh, uh, true repentance and and uh, and salvation uh, from being stoned. Uh, I just think that uh, if we uh, could only understand the um, transition, then we can see her at Christ's feet on the morning of his resurrection mm -hmm. and very first person. So we, if we can, any of us can become uh, like Mary Magdalene uh, to understand how wretched we came from to the point that uh, the Lord has uh, uh, pulled us up by our bootstraps. Not we, he did it. Amen. Uh, it put us in a position to uh, be the first to be right there with Jesus. Amen. And and I think that so many times we don't understand exactly what our role is. And if we can take the, um, the behind the scenes role of, um, of the person that is going to carry on whatever the Lord has in store for them then it really uh means that uh the day will come when we'll throw our crowns at jesus feet so i i think that's that's a uh, uh at least that's my total desire and i think maryland's too you know we just uh we just want to make sure that uh we could uh make that move and that's that's a difficult uh, place to be because we have to reach down and get what really amounts to true humility. But Christ says in, in Ellen White says in Steps to Christ that uh, there, there's nothing we can do except for just to give ourselves to him. And that is more than enough. When you give yourself, that's all you can give. Because if you're going to keep the Sabbath better, you're going to eat better, or you're going to exercise more, uh, you're going to practice all this religious stuff and read more books and memorize more stuff so you can be more educated. Believe me, this is me. This is how I've done it. But I failed for 50 years. There's one thing that I've learned that has given me hope this last year, and that Christ loves me no matter what. Okay, he never sees me as unrighteous. He sees me as clean and pure and holy because that's what he wants. He has separated my sin as far as east is from the west and, and the water thing and all that stuff. He loves me. I'm so Amen. grateful to know that. Amen. Yes. That's wonderful. Unconditional. Yes. Amen. There's a lot of great commentary and quotes in here, but I'll send this out to you afterwards if you want to explore it more in depth. Some of this I'll just be summarizing for the sake of time. And this last parable, I just wanted to briefly summarize. I never really understood the parable of the unjust judge, but that woman begged and begged and begged, and finally the judge gave her what she wanted. And this is another parable that Jesus teaches by contrast rather than comparison. 
So if this woman finally got what she wanted because she begged and begged and begged, how much more so will our heavenly father give us good things as soon as we ask for them? Some things we might have to ask for a while, but if it's good for us, the Lord will give it to us. So God is the judge, but he's not the unjust judge. He's the just judge. And Amen. a lot of us are scared of that investigative judgment of standing before Christ. But Mark pointed out in the book of Judges, the word judge actually means, do you remember, Mark, what it means in yeah, the book of Judges? Deliverer, deliverer, a savior. <laughs> he will save us from our sins. He will save us from the others. He will deliver us from this. Anyway, it's delivered. <laughs> He's our a lot of times you think of a judge as like wanting to condemn you, wanting to send you to jail, but that's not the oh. case. In this case, our judge, the one judging us, died to save us. So we are the ones, if we're not saved, it's us because we chose not to accept his death and atonement. Amen. So the unjust judge is a parable that teaches by contrast. This unjudge, unjust judge finally gave in. Our father in heaven is going to give in, but much sooner because he loves us and cares for us. So if you want to check this out further tonight, um, Ellen White has a lot of great commentary about some parables, about what lessons they have for us in these last days. And she just reminds us about this woman. She kept praying and praying and praying. And this is what Ellen White reminds us of. And we'll conclude with this thought. This is what she says. She says, there is no danger that the Lord will neglect the prayers of his people. The danger is that in temptation and trial, they will become discouraged and fail to persevere in prayer. God will never Amen. neglect your prayers. But if you stop Amen. praying, there's no way he can answer those prayers. So be like Amen. this woman, beg and beg and beg. Don't give up. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so tonight I will send you this PDF. Um, it also has the chapters of the Ellen White um, Christ Object Lessons. It has the chapters that I referenced. Um, I encourage you to go back to her book because she is such an eloquent writer. She's such a powerful writer. And she has several, several dozen pages of commentary, which will hopefully help us understand these parables even more. So in conclusion, the friend at midnight, don't stop asking for the Holy Spirit because before you give bread to other people, you need the bread. Secondly, Amen. don't be like the Pharisee. Examine yourselves, throw yourself upon Christ, and then you will walk away justified. And thirdly, Amen. be like that Amen. woman and beg, beg, beg. The devil wants you to give up. Do not give up. Keep praying and God, the just judge, will finally answer those prayers. So Amen. next week, we won't have a Bible study because we're actually in, um, let me just pause this really quick because I don't want to give all my personal information on the internet. Just a second. If you're listening, have a great night. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>